Happy Sabbath and good morning, everybody. Morning. Good to be back in Pompano, home church. Good to see you all. Y'all happy to see me? I'm happy. Oh, good. I don't want this feeling to be, uh, I didn't want this feeling to be one sided. <laughs> um, yeah. This thing is not on. Okay, give me a second to get our uh, electronics worked out. Uh, so there, um, this Sabbath, we are um, studying the lesson, the lesson number 10. It's called Mission to the Unreached. And, um, you know, in initially looking at it, uh, I thought it said Mission to the Unreachable. And I said, no, it can't be unreachable. Um, if they're unreachable, then they're unreachable. So it says Mission to the Unreached, which means they just, they just haven't been reached yet. Okay. All right, so um, our memory text says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. That is true. That is true. Let's see. Let me advance this to right here. Okay. Um, so before we, before we get started, um, each one of us is, is, is a disciple. Each one of us is a missionary of, of, of sorts because our lives, whether we realize it or not, our lives are being arranged and ordered in such a way that where we are, where we end up, the people that we meet are there by design. The places that we end up are there by design. And um, hopefully I'm going to show that uh, through this lesson today. And that those folks that we come in contact with, we have a responsibility than to, uh, to reach those people who are unreached. Um, I, um, I'm going to have the mics um, passed around. Um, so, but, but in order to, in order to say to, to reach the unreached, and this is a, a serious thing, in order to be able to reach the unreached, um, we have to be reached ourselves. We have to start there, right? In order to say, okay, we're going to leave out and we're going to go out and, um, and, and uh, witness to people, uh, we have to make sure that we've been witnessed to and have accepted the, the call and, and, the, um, and the message of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read something to you. Um, So as we evaluate ourselves, I'm just going to read, read something to you from Steps to Christ, all right? It is true that there may be an outward correctness of deportment without the, re deportment, without the renewing power of Christ. The love of influence and the desire for esteem of others may produce a well-cultured life self-respect that may lead us to avoid the appearance of evil. In other words, we may present a life that appears to be without evil, and it's, it's, it's acceptable. You know, we, 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 we gain the respect of our peers. But a selfish heart may perform generous actions. By what, by what means then shall we determine whose side we are on? Because it becomes deceitful in a way. The answer is, who has a heart? With whom are our thoughts? Of whom do we love to converse? Who has our warmest affections and our best energies? If we are Christ, our thoughts are with him, and our sweetest thoughts are of him. All we have and is is considered and is consecrated to him. We long to bear his image, breathe his spirit, do his will, and please him in all things. That's uh, from Steps to Christ, page 58. So our lives are consecrated to him. So we, we follow um, this uh, uh, missionary uh, tact by, uh, by Paul this week. 
and, un, and, and, and see how his, his trajectory, his life experiences brought him in contact with the trajectory of the Athenians and where they went, okay? I don't want to lose anyone. So there's a trajectory. And what I mean by that is then let's just look at, um, let's just look at, let's just, let's just look at, well, how did Paul get to Athens in the first place? Let's look at how, how Paul get, got to Athens. But before we look at how Paul got to Athens, I want us to look. I want us to look at, really at how the Athenians got to the situation they were in. See, Paul got to a place, Paul got to a place, and the place Paul got to was a physical place, but the Athenians got to a place spiritually. And let me just pull that up for a second. See, at the time that Paul reached Athens, they were steeped in idolatry. They were steeped in idolatry. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Idolatry? I mean, we talking about models and figures and things like that, but do we have any things that we consider idolatry in, in today's day? Do we have any modern idols that we may consider similar to the things that the Athenians were going through? Money, yeah, power, yeah, yeah. So we look at this, <clears throat> we look at this thing and say, okay, well, the, the idolatry is sin, right? Idolatry is sin. So we got to really trace this thing to like, where does like really where did it begin? So we have to go back to, to the roots of where it came from, and follow the spiritual journey of the people to the place that they got to spiritually. Because the place that they got to spiritually is a place that Paul intersected with them physically. All right. So what's the original sin? The first sin. The first sin. The very first sin. The very first sin, not with humans. The very first sin, where sin was introduced into the cosmos. Ah. Yes. Yes. I mean, that, that's the design, you know, right? Um, someone said, hey, you look like your dad. <laughs> you look like your dad. Well, how's that, how does my dad look? Well, you walk like him. Okay, I walk like him. What does that mean? My gait? No, you, you act like him. Okay, I, got, I, get, I get what you mean. I look like my dad. Okay, so <clears throat> we have a fo a certain folks that are behaving like their dad, okay? It says in Ezekiel 28, your heart became proud on account of your beauty and, your cor and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Now, what does that sound like? Sound like a person that's kind of full of himself, right? How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven, I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. So delusional. <laughs> Maybe <you> laugh. <laughs> yes. So what was his original sin? Yes. Pride. Pride. Selfishness. Self-centeredness. Yes. 
Yes. Thank you, Brother B. He became full of himself. He became full of himself. He had everything. God gave him everything. Beauty, talent. He was God's right-hand man. He was the head of the angels. He knew everything. That's how he can deceive people, because he knows the word of God. Yeah. He, <laughs> he started to believe his own hype. Yeah. Okay. Um, so... So when we when, so when we when we when we break it down and we we, we look at um, um, uh, the idols that Paul encountered in Athens, and you know they were made in the image of man, right? They were made to look like men. God, gods were made to look like men. And they were made by man. They were made to look like man, and they were made by man, made by man's hands. And they, they idolized these things that they created. But if you idolize something that you created that looks like you, what does that say? You create something that looks like you, and you idolize it, and then you bow down to it, so what are you, who are you bowing down to? Self. Yes, yes, self-worship, self-worship. Now it says, um, 2 Corinthians 3.18, the law of worship, by, the, by beholding we become changed, by beholding we become, we become like that which we admire. Think about that. We become like that which we admire, esteem or worship. Jeremiah put it in a, in a way that is a little bit less um, nice. He says, they worship worthless idols and became worthless themselves. Ouch. Ouch. Romans 18, 118. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave Thanks to him, but their, their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of their mortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So the thinking of a people strayed, strayed, strayed into, into idolatry. So, and don't want to go into too much into detail into the other things that, that pops up into it, but the, 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 some of the different behaviors that we see today. But what is it? So, so we meet Paul. We meet Paul. And Brother Paul has a journey to make. Brother Paul has a journey to make. And so do we, actually. So do we. All right, let's go there. So how did Paul end up in, how did Paul end up in, um, how did he end up in, in Athens? Anybody know? How did Paul end up in Athens? Say again. He was directed there. Yes, he was directed there. See, Paul had been to, um, He'd been to Lystra and a few other cities where he'd been run out of. Pretty much the same thing. Paul's, Paul's um, 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 call it tact, had been to the same. You go into a city, you, you, you meet up with the brethren, you go to church, the synagogue, and you start preaching and everything is going good. So he goes to Thessal Thessalonica. Thessalonica. And um, he meets some resistance there. He meets some resistance. And so then, 
Um, the brothers there pretty much run him out of town. He goes to Berea. He goes to Berea, and he starts to preach. Now the preaching in Berea started to started to have some 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 results. Some results. Paul had some good things to say about them. Why? What, what, what did Paul have to say good about the Bereans? Because they did what? What would they do? You don't have, you don't have a mic. Um, there was something different between the Bereans and the Thessal Thessalonians. If you look at um, the... I, I, I heard it right over here. I heard it over here. They search, the, they search the scriptures. So here's this guy coming into town, and he's preaching about God and Jesus and, and, and whatnot. And so rather than turning the ears off, closing everything off, and rejecting everything he's saying, they did something interesting. They were like, okay, we hear you. But we want to confirm that what you're saying is in line with the word. So, it's, so these people were different, right? Now, when we say this, when he said that they searched the scriptures, it's not that they just looked and just, oh, okay, all right, all right. No, they searched the scriptures. And it was daily, daily. So this was, this was a different group of people that accepted um, Paul's message in, in, uh, in Berea. Now, as you know, as, as God's people, life is not always going to be easy. So Paul enjoyed a, 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 a period of level of success in Berea. Because I got a hand over here. I got a hand over here. I need a mic. Um, so... So when we have a period of success, we can't, we can't sit still because God is not going to let us sit still. A lot of people listen to respond. Some listen to understand. Accuracy must go with clarity, and what those, that is what those people are all about. If what you're saying is accurate, let me clarify it from the scriptures. I like that. I like that. If what you're saying is accurate, let me clarify it through the scriptures. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, would you believe that the, the Thessalonians left their own place because of what was going on in Berea? They left their own place and went to Berea to cause trouble. The man left. He left your town, but you're going to leave your town and follow him and cause trouble there. And unfortunately, the trouble uh, persisted, so the brothers um, sent him off to, to Athens. Paul arrives in Athens, and he starts to walk around. Let's just know that he, he's, this is his first time in Athens. It's a big city. You've got statues all over the place. You've got a lot of different things. And one of the things we have to say about the Athenians is that they were creative people, very creative people, a lot of talent. But unfortunately, their talent was not used to glorify God. It was used to glorify self. They had a statue just about on every corner. They had a statue about on every corner. All right, so I was about, I was about to tell you what they used to do with the goats, but I'm going to skip that part. Um, so, I'm, so we're watching the trajectory, the physical trajectory of Paul. So Paul had been written, 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 written out of, drove out of at least five cities by now. Okay? And so he's gone from city to city to city to city. And now he ends up in a place. He ends up in a place physically and geographically to meet a people that have ended up in a place spiritually where they need Paul. All right, I'm gonna try that one more time. So 
So Paul has been traveling from place to place, place to place, on a journey. And, and sometimes he was moved because of circumstances, but he ended up in a place physically, geographically, at a time to meet a people who were spiritually at a place in time that needed him and the message that he has. Some of us have gone from place to place to place and have ended up in a place, work, church, school, building, airport, wherever to meet a people that are in a spiritual place to meet you to receive the message of hope. Okay, so there are no Pauls. We're all Pauls. Our journeys are designed for us to meet people in a place where they are spiritually so that we can be that beacon of light that they need at that time. Okay, I got a hand up. I got a hand up. It's a trajectory. People are at a place. That's all this. People end up in a place where they are in need, and we end up in a place to fulfill that need. I like what Paul did um, when communicating with respect with these people. He took advantage of what they had. They had some belief, but not all belief. So he capitalized on it. He didn't use his knowledge to put them down. He showed them love and compassion and built on what they knew, but they didn't know, they didn't believe totally, and I like that. And he convinced some of them to move forward, but not all of them. It's true. That is true. That is true. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna get. Yeah. We're gonna get to that. Um, so let's. So let's, let, let's, I mean, we, we, we all studied the lesson, and I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but I want to now talk, touch upon what Paul did when he got there, right? So Paul, when he got there, Paul did like most people do when they go to a new city. What do they do? They kind of like see what's going on, <laughs> where everything's at. Where's the museum? Where are the churches? Where are the, you know, where are the good places to eat? Right? Because if you're going to in if you're going to in, in, intervene, uh, if you're going to interact, yes, if you're going to interact with people, right, you have to know what to talk about. You know, you can't go to, you know, you go to Miami and you start talking about the New York Giants and look at you like you're crazy. You have to be immersed in the culture. And so that's what he did. He immersed himself in the culture and, um, what he found was that the culture was corrupt, very corrupt. And he was waiting for the brothers to come, but he just couldn't wait any longer. So he started preaching in the marketplace. He started preaching in the marketplaces wherever he could and to whoever was there. Y'all read that in the, in, the, in, the, in the lesson, to whoever was there. And as a result, they invited him to, they invited him to they invited him to the, 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 the public meeting. Now, usually a person that comes in and starts to teach something different, they're, they're in trouble. But in this particular case, they, he didn't really get in trouble. He was offered an opportunity to speak. OK. You know, as Christians, you all know that you know, some things are, that sometimes things sound good. We always have to be aware. We always have to be aware, though. Because you also had some people in this group. You had the, um, uh, let me get it. I think I have, I have that here somewhere. Oh, Epicureans and the Stoics. And so they're, 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 the differences between these two um, are somewhat striking. Um, people that believed in um, materialism, um, uh, 
um, avoidance of pain, avoidance of conflict, avoidance of everything. Um, they just believe that life just happens. Life just happens. Life happens, then you die, and know there's no purpose for anything. And then you have the Stoics. Um, and, these, and these people, um, they were a little bit different. They believed in virtue, um, order life, healthy, happy. Um, they advocated for courage and, listen to this, temperance and living in harmony with nature. That doesn't sound too bad, right? So if you were to look at these two people, the, um, the, the Epicureans and the, and the Stoics, which ones do you think that would, that would probably gravitate more to Paul, towards Paul's teaching? The Stoics or the Epicureans? Did you remember that? You had the... Uh, the Epicureans who were like, you know, free love. Like, kind of like the hippies back in the day. <laughs> All right. You remember that, uh, Rodney? Okay, all right. And then you have the Stoics who were uh, a little bit more, um, they're, they're into virtue, health, um, temperance, and living life. Stoics, right? Yeah. Probably, yeah, I would agree with that. Probably they're, the Stoics would probably be more inclined to, to gravitate to Paul's message. Yeah. And then, you, you know, okay. Um, what's the greatest obstacle for both groups, though? Even though they, you know, there was one group that would kind of like have some things, eh, but what's the biggest thing that would um, hold them back? What's the biggest thing that would hold them back? We talked about it earlier, because if, if you're now preaching that there is somebody, something, some entity that is greater than me, then I'm going to have a problem with that. The biggest thing that they're, going, they're facing now is that letting go of self-control. Letting go of self. I want to tell you how serious this thing is. Just digress for a second. I want to tell you how serious this thing is. Digressing for a second. We had, there's a study down now out with um, talking about students, young people that spend a lot of time on uh, computer games and graphics, right? And one of the, one of the, I guess the, the biggest things that have you know, the, the um, social scientists have taken out is that these young people are telling them that the reason that they stay in the games and they will go on like from after school up until midnight is that they have an environment. It's an artificial environment. It's a virtual environment where they say that they have control. They control the actors. They control the lives. They control. So people have an issue with letting go, because we want control. That's a form of selfishness. OK. Um, so he's taken to the uh, Areopagus. And um, what, what, happens, what happens there? What happens there? We want to know about this new teaching. What is this you're talking about? Tell us, tell us about these things. Say again. He's taken to the. So what? What is? What is? What is? What is he? What is he saying there? He's introducing what a new to them a new God. Who is this new God? Ah. ah. Ah, <laughs> he introduces a creator. 
It's like, wait a minute, the creator. Okay, that is new. That is a brand new philosophy. He introduces a creator. And then after he introduces a creator, he tells them what? Yes, we study. He tells them that they are the offspring of this creator. Ah. So as the offspring of this creator, then we have a responsibility to this creator. And he slowly but surely takes it down to, and since we are the offspring of this creator, and here we have a responsibility to this creator, then there's serious responsibility at the end, which is that the creator has a time when dispensation of our lives will be determined. He's talking about judgment. Now, let's be honest, not, we're, all, we're not all like Paul. We're not all like Paul. This is a master class in speaking to people who are different. This is a master class in, in, in bringing the word to people who are not. It, it's easy to speak to another, a person of a different um, denomination or, you know, someone that is, um, you know, some people say that they're Christian even though they don't, they don't go into church. They know a little bit. So it's, it's easier to because you have something to, 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 to start with. At least they believe in God. At least they are aware of the presence of God, right? But for some ones or individuals or entities that have no uh, concept, it's a bit more difficult. Am I right? Yeah. And so how do we start, the, how do we start that process? The Apostle Paul was received in Athens where previously he was rejected. So he found a place where people would at least listen. He had, had the Holy Spirit to where he could attempt to make ideas in their head blossom. Yes, yes. So, so in speaking to um, in speaking to believers, you know, when they're starting to, um, to, to have their ears itched by false doctrine in uh, Galatians, Paul was a little bit stern with them. He was very stern with them, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> uh, um, he says in um, Galatians 1, 6 through 9, somebody says, but even if we are, we are an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so, uh, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what we've preached, let him be eternally condemned. That is, that's pretty stern, speaking to your people. And uh, Galatians 5.12, he says, I wish that people who are upsetting you, we're talking about the people that are bringing in false doctrine, um, uh, in introducing legalism, um, I wish that those people that are bringing those things to you would go ahead and do the things that they want you to do. Okay, they were talking about castration and whatnot. But he says, if they want, if they got, if they want you to be castrated, why don't they castrate themselves? So we're talking about some very, very harsh words for the people. But here, he's talking to these people, and he does not even. So let's take it up, um, let's move it up a notch to Acts 17, verse 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, 
does not dwell in temples, nor is worship with man's hands, okay? He made from one blood one nation, and that we should seek him. And he uses their own um, poets, words, to tie the knot, to tie the knot. And I thought this was a brilliant um, move, to tie the knot. Um, and I want to share something with you at this point. Let me go down here to the end. It's right here. Yeah. Oh. It says, it is an int it's interesting to note that Paul actually quoted some of their own writers who have, who having written something fairly close to biblical truth, gave Paul an opening to take his hearers further along. Now stay with me for a second. Most of us, most of us would say that if we mix truth with error, it is error and it should be rejected. Doesn't that sound like something we would say? Come on now. If I were to sit somebody in, meet somebody in the lobby and say, hey, I've got some truth over here, and I got a little bit of error over here, and I'm going to mix it up and present it. They say, no, Brother Mike, you can't do that. You should not do that because you're mixing truth with error. And anything that is not fully true is error. Am I right? I said you have to follow Christ's example and meet people where they are. Yes. 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 You, you know, you know we, we, we can use certain terminologies that we know, you know uh, salvation and sanctification and glorification. And you talk to people that don't know what you're saying. Those words are, are flowery. But if they're not getting to the heart of the matter, to the people, their, their understanding, then it's just flowery words. And they, they, you know, they're, they sound good to us, to each other, but it doesn't mean anything to a person that you're trying to bring something new, introduce something new to, right? Ah. And you guys are gonna wake up the crowd. I gotta, I, do I have a mic back here? Um, is something in lesson that I like um, when you talk about Paul witnessing to the uh, Athenians you know that Paul when Christ called him he called him to be apostle to the Gentiles and Peter was called to be apostle to the Jews so Paul uh, in the lesson brought out the fact that Paul did not rely upon his schooling where he got from Camillo to witness, he rely upon the Holy Spirit. So in witnessing to people who don't know the, the message is reliance upon the Holy Spirit, not upon your own human self, because your intelligence cannot reach that person. So it should uh, work on the Holy Spirit. Say that own. last thing you just said again, slowly. Your human effort alone cannot reach the, uh, the people, but it's the Holy Spirit using you and bring conviction to that sinner. So it was the Holy Spirit that allowed Paul to speak, first of all, to speak at, uh, or up on that hill, Mars Hill, right? Um, it says, uh, it's, a, it's a quotation taken on page 82 of the lesson, where it says, the wisest of the hearers were astonished as they listened to his reasoning. He showed himself familiar with their works of art and their literature and their religion. Mm -hmm. But all that was done because of the Holy Spirit. Right, right. So the Holy Spirit opened up the avenue for reception of the word. Okay? The Holy Spirit opened up the avenue. So as I was saying when we first started, is that these people got to a place spiritually. Paul got to this place physically, 
physically and met those people at that particular time in history that needed that message. So the Holy Spirit is guiding all of the action. So we come down to, to us, because as the brother was saying, that there were certain things that Paul experienced that was used by him to be able to preach to these people. His experiences. Now I think we can gain much uh, knowledge and idea in how Paul uses his method of reaching out to others. Now when he went to Athens, he did not argue or debate with the people around there because Athens at the time was the seat of learning throughout the known world. Although the Romans were the one in control, but the Romans adapted or propagated the ideas or the culture that came from, uh, from Greece, and Athens is the capital city of Greece. So Paul connected with those uh, uh, people by addressing their religiosity, uh, religiosity uh, as what uh, Tuesday's lesson is all about, Paul and the unknown God. And Paul had something for them to offer. He offered the God who created uh, us. And he addressed this as the one that they mentioned. They have the altar for the unknown God. And because of this connection, he was able to bring in ideas which in later times uh, some of those hearers were convinced of the God of Paul. Yes. Yes. But, and then, then to close it off, then to close it off, he talked about the man, the man, Christ Jesus. He talked about the man, the man. All right, so um, he says, though, in times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man who has ordained, who he has ordained. He has given assurance of, of this, so all by raising him from the dead. So, yes, we may, we, we may, we, we may, say or have issues with you know his 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 tactic or whatever but if you look at it he preached the gospel he preached the gospel without using scripture he preached the gospel without using scripture it's a master class can't say that i mean i can do that at this point i would love to try but i can't say that i can do that but knowing how to reach people, though, starting out with listening, listening, listening without trying to project what we want. When we start to project what we want, we're projecting self. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that guides. And if we just listen. Uh, one thing also, um, the people group that's hard to reach are the Muslims. That, but we have one thing in common with the Muslims. Uh, Adventists and Muslims does not eat pork. So I have like an, a, um, an acquaintance or I, I, I was once a missionary to the Muslims. And that's the thing that uh, will attract the Muslims to us uh, at Seventh-day Adventist Christians because of the commonality. We don't eat pork. And also uh, we can be attracted to the Jews too because of the Sabbath. Uh, a patient of mine uh, did not know, uh, she is Jewish, she did not know that there are people or uh, religious people who worship the Sabbath. Yeah. So he, she researched on that and she found out that Adventists also does not only follow the Sabbath but are vegetarians. So she was attracted uh, to our, uh, who we are as a group, 
because of the commonality, the Sabbath. Yes. Okay, so if I have, okay, go ahead. The reason that he was able, his compassion for the Lord was just deeply in his heart. Mm -hmm. And he perceived it when he spoke to them because he truly cared about these people and he wanted these people to know about their creator. So he got their attention by that because he showed compassion mm -hmm. to these people. Okay. All right, so I'm just going to close with this um, comment here. And that is, Paul uh, does all that he can to build bridges and establish common ground, like um, uh, uh, Brother Vange was there saying. And that once we build common ground, then we can use that as a uh, starting point, a jump off point, to then introduce things that they may have never seen, and heard, or understand. Okay, so we need bridges. We can't just jump, jump right in and, and, and start uh, preaching like the, the hardcore stuff. All right. Um, Thank you all for your participation on this uh, week's lesson. Um, I pray that you'll come out next week again for a Sabbath school class. I'll just end with a word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this uh, opportunity to be here with you this morning and go through this lesson. Thank you for all those who participated and uh, had enlightening things to say to, to add uh, meaning to the lessons. We ask you to bless us for the rest of our Sabbath, we ask in Jesus' name.